you would please turn in your Bibles to Psalm number 41. Psalm 41 is a psalm of David. And if you have a modern English translation, at the end of Psalm 41, you will see the words, Book 2. The book of Psalms is divided into five internal books. Whoever put these things together in this order seem to have divided the Psalms into five books. We do not know if originally there were five separate different scrolls or codices or what they were. But Psalm 41 is the end of book one. So Psalm 1 through 41 is book one. Psalm 42 to 72 is book two. Psalm 73 to 89 is book three. Psalm 90 to 106 is book 4, and Psalm 107 to 150 is book 5. And so that is what the meaning of the words book 2. Also, if you look at verse 13, verse 13 says, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen. And this verse, these words, appear at the end of each book. So we do not believe those were originally penned by David. When he wrote this psalm, yet they are there in our Bible. We believe God put the Bible together, and what is in there is the inspired Word of God. So even though we don't adhere to the divisions, as it were, in the book of Psalms, we believe those are even inspired. There is no random anything in our Bible. And so we look at this, we read it, and we treat it as the inspired Word of God that God himself put the divisions in there, we could even say. And so when we're looking at Psalm 41, Psalm 41 starts with kind of a proverb, a beatitude. It said, blessed is the one who considers the poor. And this has the same flair, it has the same idea of the book of Proverbs. It is a proverbial saying. It says, in the day of trouble, the Lord delivers him, the Lord protects him and keeps him alive. He is called blessed in the land and do not give him up to the will of his enemies. The Lord sustains him on his sickbed. In his illness, you restore him to full health. And we say, well, that's quite the deal. All I got to do is find a poor person and consider him, maybe give him a couple bucks, and I'm going to be protected for the rest of my life. Well, that's not what it's saying. It is not a this and that. It is not a quid pro quo. It is a general truth. It is a biblical truism. It is a proverb. And the teaching from this is a teaching that is throughout the Bible. And to put it simply, it is that God will show mercy to the merciful. That if God is choosing who to give mercy to, and if you look at the two halves of what God can do. God can give justice or God can give mercy. Justice is always deserved. Justice is exactly what you deserve. And so we don't, to God, pray for justice for our lives because if we are judged in our lives plainly without Christ, all we deserve is the full wrath of God. And so at the end of time, when God is judging the world at the great white throne judgment, he will give individuals either justice for their lives, which means eternity in the lake of fire, or he'll give people mercy, which is undeserved for their lives. Their names are written in the Lamb's book of life, and they will go to the wedding feast. And so the idea that we can give mercy to others, which is undeserved, if we try to say, well... I only give people what they deserve. Well, God doesn't do that, so why should we bring that authority on ourselves? We need to be merciful, and if we are merciful, giving undeserved favor to those that are around us, whether it be somebody that you know, it doesn't have to be a poor person, as it says in this, but it it can be friends that you know, it can be family members, it can be people who rub you the wrong way, it can be people who are so totally annoying And if they would only stop being annoying, I'd be nice to them. You can give them mercy. You can give them undeserved kindness because they are so annoying. Now, the fact that you perceive them as annoying may mean that you have to pray about that to God. 
because that may be more your issue than theirs. However, we can be merciful to those around us. We can be merciful to those who see us. We can be merciful to the person checking us out at the grocery store. We can be merciful to the person who is the receptionist at the doctor's office. There are opportunities to treat people the way they deserve or to be merciful and to be nice and to be kind. And that type of person, when God is looking out over the world, choosing who to be merciful to, he is more apt to pick somebody who is merciful to show mercy to. That is what this is saying. You want God's favor, start acting favorably to other people. And that seems to be the way God will work to be favorable to us. Now, if the New Testament added on to this, to answer this, we know that the people who have the storehouse of mercy are Christians, is that we, as believers in Jesus Christ, have received mercy through salvation, through Jesus Christ, through the cross, and we therefore have a storehouse. We have nothing to gain because we have nothing to lose to be merciful of somebody else, and we know what mercy is. And so we could add to this that if you are a believer in Jesus Christ and you act like it, then in the day of trouble, the Lord delivers you, the Lord protects you and keeps you alive. You are called blessed in the land. You do not give him up to the will of his enemies. The Lord sustains you on your sickbed and in your illness will restore him to full health. These are general promises that we can accept and understand as a believer in Jesus Christ that perhaps not today I'll be healed from my sickness, but ultimately God has a plan and a future for us, and ultimately these things will be completely fulfilled. They will be fulfilled to degrees today, and there, there's studies and evidence that, that Christians have a tendency to, to live healthier lives and even live a little longer because of the choices that we make toward not offending God, which tends to be more healthy choices. And so when we look at this, we just need to ask the question, who can I be merciful to, or how over my past week did I not show mercy, and how can I do that better? And you would look at times when you gave a quick word, or were mean, or were short with somebody, or called somebody names, or did something like that as you were driving, you can give, as it were, mercy on the freeway also, and be kind to people, because God sees it all, and sees it all kind of mixed together. There is not a different life in church than there is in your car. And then David changes gears, and commentators are, are kind of wondering what he's saying here. He says in verse 4, As for me, I said, O Lord, be gracious to me, heal me, for I have sinned against you. And perhaps David is saying, here's this proverb, this proverbial truth, but he himself had not been nice to poor people, him being the king, Perhaps everybody else in the kingdom was poor compared to him, but he was not nice to people that were around him. Perhaps he was mean to people, and when he got sick, he, he senses that the reason he got sick is because he had sinned and sinned against God in some way. And his response is, we have this proverbial truth of God gives mercy to the merciful, and David, in verse 4, when he says, Be gracious unto me, he's asking God for grace, which is undeserved favor, which is the same thing in the Old Testament as mercy. He is asking God for mercy, knowing that he does not deserve it, knowing that whatever he did, whatever sin he had committed, in his mind, in praying to God, he is understanding that he deserves this punishment, if you will, but he's asking God for mercy. And as we've talked about before, that sickness can mean many things 
in our day. It can mean simply that someone sneezed on you in the grocery store. It could be that God is trying to get your attention. It could be that God is trying to slow you down. But the world is a broken, sinful, germ-infested place. And even though we know how to purify things and, and cure things and keep the bacteria over there, God is allowing even more healthy viruses to come against us of which there is no defense. But David didn't know about viruses and he didn't know about bacteria. He didn't wash his hands before he ate. Things like that that we do that we consider healthful. And so when David got sick, it could just be a sign of the times or it could be that there is really a sin. And David, in response to his sickness, says that he has sinned. And so we take him at his word that he had some sort of revelation, that he had some sort of insight into how God was dealing with him. This is the third or fourth um, psalm in which David talks about his sickness and how people react to him. And some people have said, well, this is, this is a made-up thing, because if I look in 1 Samuel, I don't see David being sick unto death. But what you have to realize is 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, the starting of the kings of Israel, not everything that David and Saul and Solomon did is recorded. Every time David changed his shoes, for example... It is not recorded in Scripture. He lived 120 years. We can't take every daily diary aspect in Scripture. And my guess is, when Samuel is writing this, he doesn't see that David has a cold as vital to the story of the life of David. Samuel is trying to write a story that shows how God is forming a a kingship for the people of Israel, that it says in 1 Samuel that the people of Israel rejected God and wanted a king. And so God is very involved in giving them a king to both straighten them out and judge them a little and to bring his grace and his glory through that king to the people of Israel. And so the story has a point of David and Solomon and Saul and Jeroboam and Rehoboam and the whole gang. Then the point is, are these kings followers of God or are they followers of Baal? And if they're followers of Baal because of their influence of a king back in those days, the whole country, most of the country, would follow the king following a false god. We don't understand that today. Somebody in Washington can believe some really weird theological things and we don't care. We believe what we want to believe and we may pray for our leaders that they may see true salvation, but their belief in something strange theologically does not greatly affect us and there's, there's been very little of people taking their theology and trying to write laws to reflect that. The laws, because they are written by all of Congress and all of the Senate, have to come from a very generalized point of view. So one person or two people with a strange theological view, uh, we, we just don't care. It's different when you have only a million people in your country when you can walk from one end of the country to the other in a couple days, when you can be right in the face of people, where people can live right outside, live on the lawn, as it were, of the palace, that you had more of an intimate relationship back in the days with tiny countries and kings over the aspects of their lives. And so... It would be seen as a good idea that the king might say, well, if you worship Baal, Baal will protect us from the strange people over there that are going to invade, the Philistines, the Amalekites, those people who are going to come and attack, that the God that you choose will protect you with something of how it was sold to the people. And many of them 
in First and Second Kings in the northern kingdom followed after Baal, and God brought judgment after judgment after judgment, and finally, in about 722 B.C., God sent the Assyrians and wiped out the northern kingdom, took them all into captivity, and they were never heard from again. The southern kingdom, because they had some good kings, were taken to Babylon and came back after 70 years, but the northern kingdom was so evil that God basically obliterated it, obliterated those ten tribes. And so when David is talking about his sin and how people are treating him, you have to realize that he's coming from the point of a king, so that he says in verse 7, All who hate me whisper together about me. They imagine the worst for me. I know that when I'm ill, when I am taken to my bed with a sickness, I have pretty solid confidence that there aren't people in this church who are wishing the worst for me. We don't have that relationship in our normal lives. However, there are people today that if the president got a cold, they would pray for his death. That is just how the world is today, is that there are people who want to change the government in Washington. There are people who want to change the government in Sacramento. And if they will do it by by hook or by crook, it seems, and they will pray for the demise of these people if they get sick, and that is the same thing that is going on here, is that these are people that probably felt they had a chance of getting the throne. And so when David is sick, when David is on his deathbed, they think, they are overjoyed because it's an opportunity for a military coup. It's an opportunity to take over the country. And so it is stronger, the people who are against David, than I think we will see in our lives. Yet there are people who celebrated at the death of Jesus Christ. There are people, when he was put on the cross, thought he was the greatest thing ever because it would now shut him up and they could continue with their corrupt religious practices. And so it is easy to see when David is having a physical difficulty and he sees people coming against him to see this as as an image of how it happens to Christ. And then when we look at countries like Iran and Indonesia, there was a, a missionary who was here yesterday who is a missionary to Indonesia. Indonesia has the largest percentage of Muslims of any country in the world. It is the fourth largest country in the world, and there are hundreds of millions, like 98% are Muslim. And so he goes, and he's trying to build uh, house churches, and he's trying to get Bibles in their language into the country, And my guess is, the way he talked about it, is that if he fell sick, a lot of those people in the Muslim camps in Indonesia would pray for his death because he is a thorn in their side as a missionary to Indonesia. And so there are Christians today that if they are having a a difficult physical time, their persecutors would think it's a great thing to happen, would pray for their death, Because in the same way they thought it would make Jesus be quiet, they feel that if they shut up the voice of this one missionary, then the word of Christ will stop in Indonesia. But God does not stop with one missionary. There are literally thousands, tens of thousands of missionaries in Indonesia. It is a very rough place, and God seems to call... Lots of missionaries. You can travel easily into and out of Indonesia, unlike China or Iran, for example. And so God is putting lots of missionaries in Indonesia. And if they get rid of that one, God has two more right behind him. And that is how God works, is that God does not let the people of this world shut up his word. God does not let the people of this world stop him from getting his word out. There is going to be people saved 
from every nation, every language, every people group. That's what John saw when he was in heaven in the book of Revelation. And seeing that, it reminds us that no matter what we see about this country being closed or this country being persecuted or this country not letting Christians in, There are Christians in those countries, and God is saving people in those countries. It may be secret. It may be something we never hear about because their lives are in continual danger. We don't know the names of the missionaries that are in Saudi Arabia, but there are missionaries in Saudi Arabia, and their lives are in danger. It is a capital offense to be a Christian in Saudi Arabia. You say you're a Christian, they will kill you. And so the idea of people speaking behind your back or saying things like, a deadly thing is poured out on you. You will not rise again from where you lie is how a lot of the world sees Christianity. And even though you may not be touched with this sort of attitude today, I guarantee you that there are many millions of Christians. Well, in China, there's, they think, minimum of 91 Most is 250 million Christians in China. You can't count them because they're spreading out and they're going to house churches as the persecution occurs. But it has been said, and it is true in China, that the more persecution that comes, the more people will believe. And so David talks about this, and then he comes to Verse 9, he says, Even a close friend of whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. And if that sounds familiar to you, that is because it is John 13, 18, where John wrote, I am not speaking of all of you. Jesus is in the upper room. He says, I know whom, him who I have chosen, but the scripture might be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has healed, has lifted his heel against me. And so Jesus in the upper room is speaking Psalm 41.9 in description of Judas. We do not know the close friend that was against David, but we know in John that it was clearly Judas because he's presented that way in John. And so even Jesus understood that these, these talks against David applied to him. Jesus even saw the persecution that was coming against him and was putting himself, as it were, in Psalm 41. This type of fulfilling scripture is not a prophecy. Psalm 41.9 is not a prophecy about Jesus. But what it is, is it shows that in the life of David, in the life of Jesus, and in our life, there are some things that are universally true. And that is, everybody that has lived or will live can think of a friend, perhaps a close friend, perhaps a best friend, that betrayed us, betrayed our trust, acted inappropriately, or did something that this is being fulfilled by saying that this is now a common experience especially for those in Christ. And we know in those lands of persecution that families are busted apart because if one person accepts Jesus, the family will kick them out because they don't want to be put in jail for this one person's faith. And so the idea of friends turning against friends for the cause of Christ is a proverbial truth that happens in Scripture and happens in many people's lives. But David comes to verse 11. He says, By this I know that you delight in me. My enemy will not shout in triumph over me, but you have upheld me because of my integrity and set me in your presence forever. He says that he knows because of his relationship with God that God delights in David. That David is not perfect, that David had sin, but God delights in him. And I'll tell you one little secret. If you're a Christian, God delights in you too. That is, throughout Scripture, that the people who belong to God, God delights in them. There is a psalm that says, you are the apple of God's eye, that if God were to sleep, well, you do. When you wake up in the morning, God can't wait to see what you're going to do because he loves you so much. He is delighted in you. 
and you are the apple of his eye. And so it isn't incongruous. We can have a difficult time. We can have a difficult life and still believe that God is delighted by us because God isn't delighted by our wealth or our stature or our house or anything like that. He's delighted in our belief and what we do. He says, but you have upheld me because of my integrity. And once again, that is, God gives blessings to those who choose integrity. You begin living for Christ, you get more direction from Christ. You begin making choices of integrity and character and truth and honesty and things like that. God will respond with more growth and more challenges and a deeper walk with him. And then it concludes with, Blessed be the Lord, God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Amen, amen. And that is a benediction for us. And so, when we think about mercy, if we go back and look at archaeology of the first century, Jerusalem changed a lot after the Romans flattened it in 70 A.D. They changed the name in 132 A.D., and a lot, the way they would do things back then is if I went to a rock quarry and I built a big building in Jerusalem from all the rocks that were way over here or the stones, if a new group comes in and they want a new building, they won't go to the rock quarry. They'll cannibalize this building that they don't need anymore. So the rocks and the stones in Jerusalem have moved around a lot. And from time to time, they find a stone or a wall that was part of a first century home church. And some of the earliest things they found has inscripted on it, scratched into it with another stone. Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy. Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy. Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy. And what we believe because of extra biblical writing is that one of the first hymns that was written by the early church, when the Christians finally got together in churches, Christ had ascended, the Holy Spirit had come, and they decided to make home churches, and they wanted to sing together. They didn't know what to sing, and they looked through Scripture, and the idea of praying for mercy, of asking God for mercy, of asking God to be merciful to us, was their first hymn. Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy. And they probably chanted it with very primitive instruments, but that is what the early church saw as our relationship to God. So we don't come to God and tell Him stuff. We don't tell Him what to do. We come to God and we ask Him for mercy. We plead with Him for mercy. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, I pray that you will be merciful with us today, that whatever is going on in our lives, that you will shower us with your mercy and your love, and you will remind us that you, in fact, are delighted in us and for us every day. Lord, we thank you for that, and we ask your blessing and your mercy on the remainder of the day. We ask this through the blood of Christ. Amen.